chapter 2, number 1. I'm not going to verse number 1. I know I'm going to preach long this morning, so don't get nervous. I told my wife the anointing of the 25-minute sermon has returned to me. I don't know where it came from, but it's back. And my wife shouted around my office as I shared it with her. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. We're continuing and completing our series entitled Unexpected during this Christmas season. We first saw the unexpected message that Mary received that she would be the mother of the Christ child while still just engaged to her future husband. And how that changed everything. We saw last week the unexpected guests, those who God invited to the party, the least, the last, the lost. That's who he reached out to, the shepherds, those who seemingly were the, the last person he would have invited. That is exactly who he chose to hang out with. But today we're going to talk about an unexpected destination. When we begin to travel, how many of you are planning on traveling this week for go see family or friends for the holiday? See, this is what just really irks me. Is I got to drive all over the world to see my family. And most of y'all sitting here just like, yeah, I'm going to get up on Christmas morning, drive three miles, be at mom's house, be back in my own bed tonight. You don't know how blessed you are. See, because you, you go to my mama's house, and she's got three bedrooms. There's her sleep number, select comfort bed that they sleep in. And then there's the not-so-bad bed. And then there's the absolutely horrible bed. And it's a race between me and my brother to get home to get the not-so-bad bed. Because if, like at Thanksgiving, you end up in the uh, bed, you don't sleep. Everybody just say, oh, poor pastor. It's, it's the price of the gospel, being a missionary to the frozen tundra of Illinois. But when you travel, oftentimes things can happen unexpectedly. This is kind of, I don't know if it's because it's cold outside or Christmas, but you know, when I was thinking about this, the thing that really came to me was the year, a few years ago, that at the end of the summer, my dad had procured a timeshare in Destin, Florida, for us to go and spend an entire week at a condominium. We had never done anything like that ever before in my life. Uh, I, was, I was probably 11 or 12. My brother was like 5, 6, 7, somewhere in there. I, I don't remember exactly our ages, but we, we got in the car after my mom and dad got off work that day and we headed towards Florida. We were so excited. We stopped in a place called uh, Athens, Alabama. And when we stopped at Athens, Alabama, my dad went in to get the motel room. And when he came out, my brother had a seizure in the car. We ended up, we were headed to Destin, Florida for a week in a condominium. We ended up spending three days in Athens, Alabama in a hospital. It was an unexpected destination. wasn't exactly what we had planned. I want you to know this morning that in the midst of all of the miraculous things that happened surrounding the birth of Jesus, because there were many miracles that happened. We, we talked a little bit about it two weeks ago, about the incarnation. The fact that Mary, being a virgin, was with child through the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not a biological transaction that produced this child, but rather it was a supernatural empowerment that placed this child who would not have an earthly father, which would transfuse the blood, the sin through the bloodline into his life, but rather he was going to be born part God, part man. It's unbelievable, hard to comprehend. But then remember this reality. The Bible prophesied about Jesus many different things, including that he would be born in Bethlehem. 
Well, Joseph and Mary didn't live in Bethlehem, but it just so happens that God put it on the heart of Caesar to put a census together so he could figure out how many people he was ruler over. And so he told everybody in the entire Roman Empire, you got to go to your hometown, be counted, and be taxed. So Joseph and Mary had literally no choice but to make a trek across the desert back to his hometown, back to Bethlehem at the exact time when Mary was about to give birth. It's miraculous, the timing. You want to know what else is miraculous? Mary is in her third trimester. How many know they won't let you fly on a plane most of the time in your third trimester? They'll tell you in your third trimester they don't want you driving very far in a car. Mary traveled in the desert on the back of a donkey and made it there. It's miraculous that she didn't go into labor on her way there. It's unbelievable. All of these miracles converging in this one moment. The star that's shining over the stable. I mean, the the angels that come to sing to pronounce His birth. All of these miracles are happening on one night. And yet there seems to be a mystery in the midst of the miracles. Because as God in His divine sovereignty has put everything together so perfectly to produce this experience, we come upon here in Luke chapter number 2 a mystery. Because God has timed everything. God has chosen. You you read in Matthew where that Mary and Joseph both come from the right birth line through the right lineage, genealogy, so that they are qualified to be the parents to Jesus and all this stuff. It's it's got all this together. And somehow God in all his planning and putting it together. Because how many know as bad as it is for you and I to put together our Christmas parties and our Christmas gifts. Can you imagine organizing the first Christmas? God did it before anybody else did. He put together the first Christmas. And he's maybe in all his planning, he just forgot to sit down and go to Priceline.com and book the room. I mean, do you think that as Mary and Joseph come into Bethlehem, there's just this sneaking feeling in the heart of God, I've forgotten something. Something. The shepherds are out there. The angels are on go. uh, The taxation, it's all the right timing. They're in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph. Oh, man. I'm supposed to get a room. I don't believe that. Think about this for a minute too though. Put yourself in Joseph and Mary's shoes. Joseph and Mary signed up for this insane reality. They gave away their future. They put at risk their their own reputation because when Mary started telling the story that the baby that was inside of her was from the Holy Spirit, people looked at her like you can imagine people would look at her. Her reputation was gone. Their marriage was already started on a shock, on on a rocky surface because of all that they were having to deal with. And they go through all this. And the reason being is because they basically, for for lack of a better term, signed up to be the surrogate of God. Because she's carrying God's baby. She's become the surrogate mother. Well, if you know anything about surrogacy, it's a con- contact contract you enter into that oftentimes if you as a woman surrogate your body or use your body to be a surrogate mother for someone else's child, they pay you a lot of money. Because any of the ladies in the house that have ever given childbirth understand you deserve a lot of money. But they pay you a lot of money. They take care of all your expenses. They do all this stuff. They make sure you have the best doctors. You go to the best hospital. All, that's all part of the package. That's all part of the deal. I bet you they even buy you maternity clothes. I don't know. I've never signed up for it. <laughs> but imagine if you were God's surrogate. You would think this must come with some pretty sweet perks. I bet you this is going to be this is going to be laden with great opportunities and yet they find themselves not even able to get a room to sleep in the night Jesus is going to be born. It really didn't act it didn't end up the way they imagined. It was an unexpected destination. But I want to remind you that even when God doesn't seem to make sense, he's usually trying to make a point. Sometimes he will 
he will surrender making sense so he can make a point to you. And I want you to know that the destination of the manger was unexpected for Joseph and for Mary, but it was perfectly planned by God in his sovereignty because that manger shows us three things about Jesus right off the first part that we want to know today. First of all, it shows us his rejection. He was not able to go in the room. There was no room for him in the inn. There was room for many other things, but there was no room for him in the inn. It is interesting to me because oftentimes what we in our own human feelings and our emotions try to avoid at all costs is a thing called rejection. If you remember back in middle school or maybe even younger for some of you when you began to see an interest in the opposite sex and the way that you went about communicating to one another was laden with trepidation because you were afraid of the rejection that may come when you saw a little boy or a little girl that you were interested in talking to instead of going up to them and talking to them or saying, would you like to go get a cheeseburger after school or something like that, you you would save yourself the immediate feeling of rejection by writing a note saying I like you do you like me circle yes or no because there's just something inside of you that said if that note comes back with a no at least I wasn't looking them in the eye at least I don't have to go through that moment of rejection and, and let down right there personally I can have have it somewhat in my own the privacy of my own locker I can see it by myself and I can just spend the next six months never making eye contact with that person again because we hate rejection and I know we mature and we get beyond some of the things that, that we used to do as children. But the reality is, I don't think anybody in this room has aged out of a hatred for being rejected. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want people to like us. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I have a pretty simple rule system when it comes to who I like and who I don't like. If you like me, it's probably a 98% chance I'm going to like you back. If you don't like me, it's less than a 2% chance I'm going to like you. Pretty simple. I like to be liked. People who like me make me want to like them. People who don't like me make me want to not like them. I don't like being rejected. I don't like feeling like people don't like me or don't want to be around me or think negatively of me. But understand this. The Bible tells us in John chapter number 1 that in the beginning the Word was God and the Word was with God. Speaking of Jesus being the Word and that Jesus spoke into existence all the worlds in which we see. He created humanity. He created all that we see and then the Bible says that he came unto his own and his own received him not. Jesus understood before he came that he would be rejected. He did not have this grand scheme in heaven where when God comes to him and says, we need to send, I need to send you, Jesus, to the earth because they're sinners and they need a Savior, and so I'm going to send you. And Jesus didn't sit there and go, oh, I bet this is going to be awesome. They're going to be so excited to see me. Everybody's going to worship me. Everybody's going to love me. No, Jesus in heaven understood that the moment he came to this earth, he was going to face the rejection of humanity. He understood that we wouldn't understand him. He understood that we wouldn't be able to comprehend who he really was. And he understood that due to our own sinfulness, we would become jealous and hateful towards him. And we would ultimately reject him. And yet understand this, he came anyway. What an amazing reality. Some of you here this morning, you have been rejecting Jesus. You've been pushing him out of your life and you think that it has bothered him, upset him, or disturbed him. I come to tell you, friend, he expected your rejection and yet while you were yet sinners, Christ came to give himself for you. Your rejection has not changed his perception of what he feels about you. He loves you anyway. This world is rejecting him in unparalleled fashion. It is amazing to me 
don't get me wrong. Scripture does not tell us to celebrate the birth of Jesus. It tells us to celebrate His death, burial, and resurrection as often as we can through communion. But it doesn't say anything about celebrating His birth. I understand that Christmas in its origins and its present day celebration have some secular and even heathenistic connections. But the reality is this, in the United States of America, the season of Christmas has traditionally for centuries been a season when we celebrated Jesus coming to the earth. But now we have arrived in such a politically correct society that they don't want us to celebrate Christmas anymore. They want to turn it into the winter holiday. Let me submit to you something. I am for freedom of religion. That is why I don't want them to change Ramadan into something it isn't. I just choose not to celebrate it since I'm not a Muslim. I don't need them to change Hanukkah into something it isn't. I'm just not going to celebrate it because I'm not an ancestral Jew. you got to understand that Christmas is the season that we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And if you're not cool with Jesus being the center of our celebration, get your own holiday. We're not forcing Jesus down your throat when we put a nativity scene up for Christmas any more than you're forcing your favorite sports team down my throat when you put a G on the back of your van. Just celebrating who we are. Celebrating Jesus. The world is rejecting Him. But I love it because as much as we try to take prayer out of our schools, uh, you, the latest thing is they've got a lady who's suing the Gideons and trying to remove every Gideon's Bible out of every motel room in the entirety of the United States of America. That's her goal. She wants to remove every Bible out of the motel rooms. They're taking Christ out of Christmas. All of this rejection, and yet i got good news for you. As much as we shake our face in the in the face our hand in the face of God and reject him Jesus still looks down upon us and says I knew you was going to do that and it doesn't bother me a bit cuz I still love you and I'm still available to you you can reject me reject me reject me but you're never going to cause me to stop loving you secondly it pictures his redemption When you think about it, where else should a lamb have been born than in a stable? Where else should a lamb have been laid than in a manger filled with hay? We understand that we celebrate Jesus coming to the earth and Christmas time, but we also recognize that Christmas' entire existence is to produce Good Friday and Easter. Jesus did not come to the earth to see what living like us was like. Jesus did not come to the earth to teach us and to preach to us. Jesus did not come to the earth to work miracles and to do mighty wonders. He did all of those things, but don't ever miss the fact that Jesus wrapped himself in human flesh, landed in the manger, all the while with his eyes firmly planted upon a cross in his future. He knew he was being born to die. The Apostle Paul tried to help us remember that redemption is at the heart of the Christmas story. In two passages he writes about the incarnation. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 he said, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus came to redeem us. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bondservant, and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the When sin entered into humanity in Genesis chapter number 3, immediately God instituted the sacrifice to cover the sin. 
throughout generations, they had offered sacrifices to cover sin. But the problem is, as soon as the blood would dry, there would be new sin needed covering. And year after year after year, they would offer the sacrifices. Year after year after year, there would be this empty reality as they realized that the blood had covered their sin, but they were still sinners. It was in this backdrop that God, in His divine foreknowledge, had pre-planned, pre-ordained, and predestined to sin. His Son is the Lamb of God, because He, being half God, half man, fully God, fully man, all at the same time, wrapped up in human flesh, would have the ability to overcome our sin nature, but would also have the susceptibility to temptation that would make Him a successful su substitution for us and our sinfulness. He he came so that he could bleed on the cross. He came so that he could die because he understood when he died, when he shed his blood, his blood would not just cover our sins, but his blood would cleanse our sins. His blood wouldn't just help us to get past what happened. His blood would empower us to be different than we were. Somebody said, well, did it work? Well, we read in Revelation John said, I saw a book. And I said, anybody going to open the book? Because that book was the destiny of humanity. When man sinned in the garden, we gave up our own authority to make our own decisions. Ultimately, we gave authority to Satan so that he could rule and reign and our sin natures would drive us. And from that point forward, he became the prince of the power of the air. He was in control. He's driving men into utter darkness. Worse and worse and worse and worse. And John, recognizing what that was, the title deed to the earth, said, is there anybody who's worthy to open it? And they said, no, there's not one worthy. Because you see, God had been looking. There had been many seeming good candidates. A man named Abraham. Stepped out from everything he knew to walk by faith. But in a moment of testing, he proved he was a liar. Moses was a deliverer for God's people. But in the heat of the moment, he threw a temper tantrum and stained his ability to even receive the promise of God in his own life. David was a man after God's own heart, but he became an adulterous murderer. Everyone failed. Everyone fell short. And John said, I began to weep because none were worth it. And then the angel tapped me on the shoulder and said, Look, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he said, I, John, turned and saw a lamb as if it had been slain before the foundation of the earth. And he said, this is what they began to say. Worthy, worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And he goes on to tell about others who joined in the worship because here's the reality. Jesus came as the Lamb of God. He paid the price for our sin and it was works. He was enough. His blood covers the entirety of all sin. All you have to do is receive it. It pictures His redemption. He has redeemed us, bought us back. But lastly this morning, it pictured His reachability. We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, or last week, when we saw the announcement of his birth didn't go to the king. The announcement of his birth didn't go to the politicians, didn't go to the professional sports stars, it didn't go to the, the latest, greatest pop singer. The announcement of his birth went to the dirty, dingy shepherd. The people nobody else wanted to be around. They were invited to come. G God split planned this place for Jesus because he wanted us all to understand from the get-go 
that it doesn't matter who you are. He's within your reach. Oftentimes, we live in a society where anybody ever heard this statement, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. There's so many deals out there that seem too good to be true. You've, you've seen the commercials, and, and I, I, I walk really, really delicately here because we have some really good car salesmen in our church. You know, a couple of them. I know Sherrod and Larry, they'll treat you right. And, and Joe, if he's here, he'll treat you right. You know, different ones like that. Maybe there's some others. But then there's some of them that won't treat you so right. You ever seen, you ever seen the commercial where it says, you know, come in. All credit types are welcome. If you'll come in, we'll give you the newest thing on our lot for $212 a month. And then at the end of the commercial, as, as the music's playing loud, there's just under, there's little bitty print that says uh, approved credit required. You go in there and you let them run your credit report, and if you don't have a credit report over 900, they say, I'm sorry, you, you don't qualify for this deal. But let me show you what I can do for you. I had one time, my wife and I, when we, this is the first time we bought something that we didn't pay cash for. And we were, we were like excited. We, we were shooting way too high. We wanted this really beautiful Dodge Journey, not the one we ended up getting. It was, it was another one months before that. And, and, and these people, they're like, yeah, we're going to work a deal for you. We're going to work it out. Da, 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 da. They're like, go to lunch. You come back. We're, we're going we're gonna to sign this deal. I go to lunch, I come back, and they pull, this was like a, a 2009 Dodge Journey, this was like in 2010 or 11, and the thing had like 25,000 miles on it, it was so sharp, and they pull up a, a 98 Ford Windstar with 112,000 miles on it and said, this is what we could sell you for $250 a month, like we said. I was not a happy person. And I did not buy that van. But sometimes it feels like your whole life, everybody's always opportunities and you're unqualified. You hear about a, a grant that somebody else got and you apply for it, you're unqualified. You hear about a job somebody else got and you apply and you're unqualified. You, you, you tried to get on the sports team at school and they said, you're unqualified. You tried to go to a certain college, they said, you're unqualified. It just seems like life is filled with moments where you want to better yourself. You want to do things. You, you want to get out of the mess you're in. But everywhere you look, every time you reach out, it's unqualified, unqualified, unqualified. But I want to tell you this morning, this gospel that I'm preaching to you today, Anyone in this room, the only thing it takes to be qualified to be saved by Jesus Christ is to be a sinner. If you're perfect here this morning, if you have never sinned, if you've never done anything wrong, if every time in your life you've done the right thing, I've got no good news for you. But for the rest of us, that have fallen for the rest of us who've made mistakes, for the rest of us who've done the wrong thing on purpose, just rebelling against God. I want to do it my way. I want you to know Jesus came in a manger so you would know that no matter how far from Him you are, no matter how low you have gone in your life, no matter how dirty your situation is, He wanted you to know, I was born in a mess because I like to get in the middle of the mess, roll up my sleeves, and turn it into a message. Whoever you are, wherever you are, I want you to know this morning, Jesus is as close as the mention of His name. Just cry out and He'll come to you right where you are. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to change yourself. You just got to cry out, Jesus! Stand with me all over the sanctuary this morning. tell you, last night I watched the Dallas Cowboys surrender the sixth game they should have won this year that they did. And I 
tell you, being a Cowboys fan this year is reminiscent of being a Cubs fan from years gone by. Just find a way to lose. One father was watching the football game one night. And his little girl was asking him all kinds of questions. And he, he, he'd been busy all week. He'd worked hard. He just wanted a few minutes of escape into the football game. Loved his girl. Loved his child. Just needed some quiet. And so he devised a plan. He saw a newspaper sitting right beside him that had a world map on it. Knowing she was four or five years old, she didn't know geography yet. He took that map and ripped it up into pieces, handed it to her and said, Here, baby, here's a project. When you get the world back together, you come show me and then we'll talk. He thought he had bought himself the rest of the game. Five minutes later, a little four-year-old girl comes back. Daddy, I've got the world together. He said, How did you do that? She said, Well, it's easy, Daddy. On the other side of the world, there was a picture of Jesus. And I figured out if I get Jesus back in his place, the world would come back together too. I know that's awful simple, but it's awful true. Your world has fallen apart around you. You don't even know what to do anymore. You, you don't know where to turn. You don't know who to ask. You, you are out of options, friend. And you come this morning. I don't know why you're here. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you felt religious obligation to be here. Or maybe you just stumbled through the door. I, but God brought you here to let you know that everything may have fallen apart in your life. But you are as close as getting Jesus back in the center of your life for everything else to come back together. If you can get him where he belongs your world will begin to make sense again but until you get him back in place nothing's changing every head bowed every eye closed no one looking around for just a moment you're here this morning you say Pastor Ryan I need to get Jesus back in his right place you're here maybe you've never trusted in Christ maybe you've never made him Lord of your life or maybe you're here and you've made Him Lord of your life, but you've walked away from Him. You've tried your own way, doing your own thing. You think you're smarter than Him. You think you got better ideas than He does. And the truth of the matter is, as hard as you try, everything's just falling apart. It's crumbling. You're pursuing finances, but you can't get ahead. You're pursuing career, but you can't get the job. You're pursuing relationships, but none of them ever work out. You just keep chasing and chasing and chasing. And friend, I'm going to tell you, you can spend the rest of your life chasing, and you'll never find it because what you're looking for is right here this morning, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger that said, I was born for no other purpose than to redeem you, to save you, to change you, and to empower you to live life like you were in, in created to live you're here this morning you say pastor that's me I'm going to count to three when I say three I want everyone in this room that says I need Jesus today whether for the first time or whether you're coming back after a while away uh, there's, there may be somebody here in this room that you're thinking to yourself if anybody else in this room knew where I've been or what I've done they wouldn't sit here with me well friend I want to let you know that God knows exactly where you've been and what you've done and he's not the least bit uncomfortable around you because he loves you anyway. There's no sin you've committed that he hasn't already placed under his blood for somebody else. You say, I'm such a bad sinner. God has forgiven sinners far worse than you. Far worse than you. Some of them are sitting in this building this morning and they look awful spiritual today. But you should have seen them 25 years ago. You should have seen them seven months ago. You should have seen them because they didn't look like that back then. Jesus has made a change. I'm going to count to three. Maybe some of you here today, you're as faithful to church as anybody around. You've been in church your entire life. But the truth of the matter is you've never given it to Jesus. You'll split hell wide open just like any heathen you know. Because Jesus is the only way. He's the only one who's worthy. He's the only one who can make us right with God. You need Jesus today. Count to three. One, two, three. Lift your hand right where you are. Lift your hand right where you are. Thank you. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody else today? Their hands all over the room. You won't be alone this morning. You won't be alone this morning. Thank you. Thank you. God is speaking to your heart today. God is speaking to your heart today. Don't turn him away. Don't turn him away. This is the right time. This is the perfect time to give him a chance. All right, I want everybody in the building to pray with me this simple prayer. We're going to pray a prayer. If you've been around here very often, you've heard me say these words. There's absolutely nothing magical about the words we're going to say. The words won't save you, but it's the faith in your heart that you attach to it. If you believe what we're praying for yourself personally, something's about to change in your life simply through the faith that you place in my Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you sent your Son that even though you would face rejection, Jesus, you chose to come. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that today you are drawing me unto Jesus. I recognize I am a sinner and I need a Savior. So I ask you now to wash me in your blood. I place my faith for my salvation in Jesus Christ alone. Not what I've done. Not who I am. Not where I go to church. But in Jesus alone I trust. And I confess Him as Lord of my life. And I will spend the rest of my days serving Him. In Jesus' name I pray today. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to make a spectacle out of anybody, but here's the deal. We've all been there, done that. We've all had our moment. And this is what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, if you are ashamed of me before your brethren, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. But if you will stand for me before your brethren, I'll stand for you before my Father. You and I need Jesus to be on our side. We desperately do. And so all He asks of us is to take a step of faith, of confirming our faith by saying, I am one of them. And I wonder if you raised your hand this morning and you prayed that prayer and you would just have the audacity and the confidence and the faith to step out of your seat and come to this altar right now and just proclaim to everybody here, anybody that's watching, said, today I gave my heart to Jesus. Today is the beginning of a brand new day for me. Anybody this morning, you got the confidence to do it? Come on, come on. Come on, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to pull you out of there. I'm not going not gonna to make a spectacle of you, but I'm telling you, it'll make you feel better if you just testify a little bit. If you just let everybody around you know something just changed. Thank you. Somebody else today. Anybody else? Now? I'm going to wait for you about 20 more seconds. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. 20 more seconds. You got 20 more seconds to let the world know you're different. 15 seconds to let the world Jesus saves your soul. Oh, 10 more seconds. I know crowds are intimidating, but if you weren't able to step out, if you're afraid to do that, don't go to bed tonight till you tell somebody. It, 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 you say, I don't even know anybody to tell. Well, then grab somebody beside you and say, you don't even know who I am, but Jesus saved me today. That's all right. I guarantee you, whoever is beside you will either celebrate with you or needs you to pray them through. All right, but tell somebody Jesus has saved you. Let's welcome our sister into the family today. Her faith has made her whole. Praise God. Well, I love you. Have a merry, merry Christmas. You are dismissed, First Assembly. I'll see you on January the 3rd.